Hey there, Marcus Hutzel here, and I wanted to share a recent photographic success of mine, and that's taking headshots or portraits of my fellow employees. And I wanted to walk you through my setup, which camera I use, which lights, and positioning of those elements, and just show you the process. And the reasons I wanted to share this here are that, number one, I'm very proud of the results. And number two, I am not a professional photographer in the sense that I do not currently make my primary living by taking photos. I am in the live event production industry and have been doing that for about 20 years, providing audio, video, and lighting support for corporate conferences, live events, live streams, concerts, and using high-end broadcast video cameras, PTZ cameras, and cinema cameras for a lot of video in my live event production work and doing a decent amount of videography and editing as well. But still photography, and specifically portrait photography, is not on my primary plate of income or responsibilities. So I wanted to share my experience because I hope it's a bit of an inspiration for you. So I've been into cameras and photography for a long time, and I've taken tens of thousands of photos, including that large print on the wall behind me. But most of my photography has been serendipitous photography, landscapes, artistic photos, many of which I've printed and displayed at work or here in my home, and I even have a photography book. And I just enjoy photography for how it helps me document and capture and remember life as it unfolds in front of me. But I haven't taken a lot of headshots or portraits of people, and that's where there's a difference in the types of photographers, because portrait photography is about getting emotions and reactions out of people for the best photo, and for an introvert like me, sometimes that's the hard part. And with the summers in my live event production work being generally slow, and with some personnel changes at work, came the need for new headshots for our employees, and came the courage for me to take on this project. And we wanted a standardized look across all of our headshots so we could put out a unified photographic front. And I decided to go with a fairly standard, not always popular, but corporate friendly, completely white background with a medium or generally waist up or bust shot. Some people don't like this look with the completely white background, and I originally didn't like it either, but I've come to appreciate it. And to be quite honest, when my coworkers asked if I could take their photos, I was a bit scared because with lack of experience comes lack of confidence. I did actually take headshots for our company previously, but I wasn't very proud of that first round of photos. I had no help, nor did I ask for any help. My lighting was wrong, the color was wrong, I had to do a lot of editing, they just weren't great. I basically learned what not to do that first time. But with three more years of experience, I felt I was up to the challenge, and a lot of my confidence actually came from the knowledge and techniques from a couple of photographers I've seen here on YouTube. So I have to give them credit here because they absolutely helped me in feeling like I could take on this project, and they helped me further understand some of the technical aspects of how to do portraits well, and a bit of how to edit them. And the first person that I really learned this from is Sean Tucker. He put out a YouTube video a few years ago where he was doing the white background corporate backdrop headshot look, and he did another video on how he edited those headshots. And watching both of those videos is really what gave me an initial understanding of how to do this well. I'll link to those videos below. Now, Sean was using flash photography, which I'd never done before, and I didn't own any strobes or flashes, so I used video lights or continuous lighting for a couple of reasons. The main reason is that because the company I worked for already owned way more than enough video lights for me to use for free, and because with continuous lighting, the lights are just on, just like they are now as I record this video, so you can just see immediately what you're going to get when you take the photo. So continuous lighting is just basically not using flash. Now, I didn't edit my photos the same way as Sean did, and I'll try to walk through how I edited real quick a bit later. But I also got inspiration and learned a lot from Peter Hurley's channel and his long history of taking professional headshots using not only natural light, but more importantly, if you know Peter, he's all about continuous lighting. So huge thanks to Sean Tucker and Peter Hurley for their wisdom and sharing of that wisdom, because I'm very proud of my results using tips from both of their methods. Okay, so the technical process is simple enough to understand, but if you don't get the lighting in the right place or the color right, people will not look good and they won't like the photos. And I was quite amazed at how good the headshots looked straight out of the camera. And that's not because of the camera. Yes, this is a good camera, but 
it's really because of the lighting. They aren't lying. Good lighting can make or break your photos or videos. And even with that stark white background, I thought the skin tones came out really great on everyone. And I did use one tool on my Sony camera to help me with this process. More on that in just a bit. Now, the benefit of using a completely white background is that it's a lot easier to replace or expand the background later if needed. If I had taken the shots with a pattern in the background, it might make it harder to change the look with editing. Then again, Adobe products and our new friend AI are getting really good at cutting people out of a photo, but I still like practical in-camera photography and video whenever I can achieve it. I'm not a huge fan of green screen. I like creating the picture manually with real things in the camera view. And with green screen, if you don't edit things properly, you can get some green spill onto people's hair if you're not good with your editing. And I'm really proud of my practical results. All right, so let me walk you through my setup real quick. For the camera, I use my Sony a7 IV with the Tamron 28-75 f2.8 lens. This is the version one lens. I had it set up on my KNF Concept S210 tripod with a sandbag to weight it down using my tripod weight hack, which I talk about in one of my other videos. And initially I was just going to plant the camera on the tripod and take everyone's picture with the same zoom or focal length, but not everyone looked the same with the same framing or the same camera height or zoom range. So I ended up going handheld with the camera a lot of the time and moving around. And that meant my focal length went between around 45 millimeters all the way out to 75 millimeters, depending on the person. And I needed to get some group shots as well. So I would move my tripod out of the way and put myself wherever I needed to be for good framing. I did all the setup by myself, which meant I needed to see what I was doing in real time. So I set up my Holly Landmars 300 wireless transmitter on the HDMI output of the Sony a7 IV which transmits the video signal wirelessly to any other Hollyland video receiver. And I use my Hollyland Mars M1 monitor to view the camera's output because the M1 monitor has a transceiver built in. So it's compact and it does wireless video excellently. I also connected to my camera via the Sony iOS app on my iPhone or my iPad. And this allowed me to take pictures remotely so I could do test shots on myself and to make changes to shutter speed, ISO, and aperture all while seeing myself on a larger monitor. And using a larger five inch monitor was better than the smaller iPhone screen. And the M1 monitor gave me more exposure tools like waveforms and false color to really dial in my exposure. And this remote viewing setup is great when you're using continuous lighting for photos because again, what you see generally is what you're gonna get. And I set the aperture to F5 on the camera because I wanted the nose all the way to the back of the ears to be in focus. And I had some group shots where people would be at slightly different depths. Quick note, when you're doing that, I would advise stopping down to smaller than F5 as some of the people in some of my group shots weren't completely in focus because we had people standing a little too far in front of others than I expected, which meant F5 didn't quite have the deeper depth of field I needed. The photos were usable, but F8 probably would have been a little better. But you have to balance all of these things like shutter speed, ISO, aperture, and lighting because with continuous lighting, you can't always use a terribly fast shutter speed because continuous lighting is just not as bright as a quick momentary flash from a strobe. So that meant I would have to use a slower shutter speed on my camera, which could lead to blurry photos if my shutter speed were too slow or if I was moving around a bit too much or if my subject moved a little too much. So after setting the final lighting percentages, I settled on an f-stop of f5 and 1 one hundredth of a shutter speed. And that meant my ISO needed to be at 1000. And although an ISO of 1000 may sound fairly high as the base ISO on the Sony a7 IV is 100, ISO 1000 still looks really great on the a7 IV because it's a full frame camera and is just very clean, even at seemingly higher ISOs. So even with 1000 ISO, there was just really no noise to even worry about. Now this is really a little bit backwards from the way you want to do it to get the best and cleanest images because normally you would want to set all of your camera settings first to guarantee that you were going to get as low noise sharp of an image as you can, like a fast shutter speed, lower ISOs, and then you would dial in your lighting. But my lighting was a bit limited, so I kind of just had to work the camera settings against the lighting as I kind of adjusted everything in real time for the best settings between all of my elements. So those are the camera settings. Now let's talk about the backdrop and lighting setup. 
I needed a somewhat large but budget-friendly, completely white fabric backdrop, and I found a 10 foot by 10 foot white backdrop on Amazon for 25 bucks. And I already had a backdrop frame, a very cheap one from Emart that cost around $45. It only goes up to 10 feet wide. And I wondered if that was wide enough because I wanted the talent to be a little bit away from that backdrop. So a 10 foot wide backdrop seemed to be the minimum width I needed to keep everything in the camera frame while being able to keep the talent away from that backdrop a bit and while still filling the entire camera frame with white. And all this meant I was able to put people about five feet out in front of the backdrop. So when I got in position to take the photo, first of all, again, the backdrop completely filled the frame of my camera from top to bottom and from left to right. And second, once someone was in their position for their photo, they then had white on three sides of them, white all the way above their heads, as well as to the left and the right of each shoulder or arm. For lighting positions, I used classic three-point lighting. A main key light, which I chose to put on the talent left because that's where I like the light on me here on the left side of my face. So that's what I did. I had a matching light on the right as a fill light, but at a lower intensity. I had a hair or rim light on the same side as the fill light, but behind and slightly above to provide a bit of down backlight here, kind of like this, that light right there to give some contour to the dimmer side of the face. For now, we're gonna turn that off. For the key and fill lights, I used two Godox VL150 daylight balance fixtures with inexpensive newer 36 inch octagon soft boxes. The key light was at around 87% and the fill light was around 40 to 45%. For the rim light, I used a Godox SL60W with a reflector instead of a soft box and it was at about 14%. And I wanted to put some more light on the white backdrop itself to try to overexpose that white backdrop. So I grabbed another SL60W and put it directly behind the stool where people would be sitting. This way the person's body would hide the light as it sat behind them. This did help, but the SL60W isn't that wide of a throw, but it was better than nothing because it did get the center of the images closer to pure white, which again also helped with editing later. And again, because I made sure there was white on all three sides of them, that means you can always expand the photo later. So you can take a square photo and make it 16 by nine or eight by 10 or any ratio you really need. So looking at some of my test shots, here's one one hundredth of a second at F5 ISO 800, just not quite bright enough. So I bumped the ISO to 1000 and then I started adjusting the lighting a bit more. And again, as I said, this process is a bit backwards. Normally you wanna set your camera settings first to ensure you know you're gonna get clean images, then adjust the lights. But the video lights I had weren't super bright and I didn't want to completely blind people when they sat in the chairs since the rest of the lighting in the space we were shooting in was going to be pretty much completely off and dark. So bringing people into a brightly lit space within a huge darker space on a white backdrop can be a bit of a shock and I didn't want to freak people out. So I started with the lighting a bit lower and brought it up enough just to where people felt comfortable, but still well lit and still with decent settings on my camera. And I think it was a happy medium between everything. And that's basically where I ended up. One one hundredth of a second, 1000 ISO, F5, four lights in total, a 10 foot wide backdrop, talent about five feet from that backdrop. And here's a quick diagram of the entire setup. And I used the Sony a7IV's custom white balance option and used the white backdrop itself to set my white balance. And that worked really well. Once everybody got in front of the camera with the custom white balance, their skin tones just looked pretty perfect. Now I always shoot in both JPEG and RAW because I want the flexibility in editing. However, I just ended up using the JPEGs for editing and final delivery because they just looked great right out of camera. I actually thought they looked better than the raw images. But of course, the JPEG files on just about any camera take on any of the creative looks that the camera is deciding to impart on the photo. So in this instance, I'm letting Sony decide a few things about the color of those JPEGs, knowing that I can always grab the raw image if needed which wouldn't have any of those decisions the camera is making. But I always shoot in the neutral setting with my Sony a7 IV, so the camera is adding too much saturation or contrast or sharpness over the raw images. However, that cheat or trick I was talking about earlier 
Well, with most Sony Alpha cameras, they have a built-in effect called soft skin effect. And it has three settings, low, mid, and high. And this will add a smoothing effect to skin, assuming the camera finds a face within the autofocus. And I chose to turn on the effect and have it on the low setting. Now, this soft skin effect can absolutely be overdone when you use it on any camera or on any social media posting platform because almost every camera editing app has some sort of skin smoothing feature. You have to be very, very careful with it. And it does permanently alter the JPEG images as well as any video you take when the effect is on. So be careful. But honestly, most of the time when you're taking headshots or portraits, you're probably going to edit them a bit anyway. And a lot of the time you may be doing some softening in post to make skin a little more smooth. And I figured why bother spending the time editing in post? Just do it with the camera and save myself that time. And if I don't like it, again, I can just use the raw images because those creative looks and soft skin tone effects do not get applied to the raw image files. So after people started coming in and the first person that sat down, they just looked so great through the camera and I had my monitor set up so they could see themselves and frame themselves up make sure they, they were comfortable looking at themselves and how they were sitting. Everything just went really smoothly. I just got in there, took the camera off the tripod a little bit, just moved around with different people, made sure they were laughing or smiling a little bit. We got a lot of candid shots and I was just really happy with how well things looked right from the get-go when that first person sat down in the chair. And I think having me take their photos, since I know everyone, they're my colleagues, they're my friends, it made everything a little more comfortable. I was able to get more smiles out of some of them. Some of them don't smile that much a lot. Uh, some of them look more stoic. I do not have a good stoic look, so I have to smile on camera. But I got smiles out of some, and some just remained their great stoic selves. But the whole atmosphere was fun. Uh, again, it helped me knowing everyone ahead of time. I didn't have to learn someone's name or how to get them to laugh. Those things help. And that's the difficult part of being a portrait photographer. Being an introvert, I'm not as introverted with my coworkers. Since I was proud of these results, I just wanted to share it here. Thank you for watching. If you've watched this far, I think this video has gone on long enough. So as far as editing goes, I'm going to do another video on how I edited these. Because again, as I said in the beginning of this video, the way I shot and the exposure that I got on the white backdrop and on people's faces and using the soft skin effect on my Sony camera meant I had to do very little editing. So that video hopefully will be a little shorter, but either way, uh, it was a quick, quick edit in Lightroom. So look for that video in my library. Know that you can do this too. Uh, go out there, practice, and good luck. See you later. Hang on, change of plans. Why don't I finish this video by showing you a walkthrough of the actual space I used to take those headshots. You'll have to forgive the audio. It was very loud in the space I was in that day. But either way, take a look. See you there. All right, so here we are in the actual little setup that I used to take these headshots. You can see the 10 foot white backdrop behind me. That's a very inexpensive backdrop on a very inexpensive and lightweight backdrop stand. And just behind the talent, I put an SL60W um, to try to just blow out the background a little bit. We have one other SL60W up here providing, you know, just a little bit of shoulder light. You see the reflection right there. So we get a little bit of contour on people's faces. And then out front, you can see I've got two soft boxes on these rolling stands. They are 36 inch octagon soft boxes, nothing fancy or too expensive, and they work just fine for what I need. And this light over here is my key light. This one is my fill light. And both of these stands have a Godox VL150 on top of them. And my key light is set to 87%, as you can see. And my fill light is set at 43%. That backlight is set to about 60%. And then my shoulder light, my hair light, is at about 14% just to give talent that little bit of contour on their face when they're sitting in the photo chair. Just a little bit more practice for me in a very low stress environment, taking these pictures for my coworkers. I'm very proud of them. I think everyone liked them. And I just wanted to show you this setup because I think it worked really well. And uh, yeah, that's about it.